Welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm Ryan Coonerty. Along with Debbie Cox Bolton of the New Deal, I'm lucky enough to be your co-host. Honorable Profession is a New Deal Leaders podcast. The New Deal is an organization that supports the next generation of American leaders. From attorneys generals, to state senators, to mayors, to school board members, these are the people that are pushing policies and politics that will respond to climate change, rebuild our economy, address racial injustice, and restore our democracy. These are incredibly talented people who have dedicated themselves to public service when their country and their communities need it the most. Check out NewDealLeaders.org to see what I'm talking about. Today, I'm talking to another great American mayor, Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas. He's a Kansas City native who experienced homelessness and poverty as a child. He excelled academically and was teaching at law school when he first ran for city council. A couple years later, he took on the establishment and ran successfully for mayor. We talk about his efforts to help at-risk youth, respond to covid provide free public transportation, and increase affordable housing. He's someone a lot of us are looking to for solutions to our most challenging issues. Enjoy. Mayor Quentin Lucas, welcome to An Honorable Profession. It's wonderful to be speaking to you today. It is great to talk to you. Happy to visit and happy to talk to everybody who's listening. Perfect. So we have a lot of important policy to talk about, but we're recording this the day after opening day. The Royals won last night, and I thought it'd be kind of fun to have you tell us a little bit about what it's like to be mayor of a city that's going on a championship sports run in professional sports, and what's that that like? You know, it has been an amazing set of years. Certainly lots of challenges, lots of issues, but a lot of fun, too, (laughs) uh, which is something that we've needed over the last year and a half or so. I mean, the Chiefs going to a Super Bowl back at the beginning of 2020, winning, which was great. We still got our parade in. And then in 2021, having the opportunity to uh, go back to the Super Bowl, even if the outcome is something that those of us in Kansas City want to avoid talking about, it has been great, brought the community together and done a lot of the work that we think is so key to making sure that folks know that this is a, uh, an exciting, a dynamic city, but one that actually can be unified as well. And did you do one of those mayor-to-mayor bets uh, around the Super Bowls? Oh, we absolutely did. I bet barbecue, of course. I had to deliver on the bet this year. I didn't last year. The mayor of Tampa had bet me some wonderful cigars, drinks, all types of stuff, which was going to be great. The mayor of San Francisco bet me wonderful garlic noodles from the Super Bowl last year. Uh, I had said I would go to San Francisco and eat them at some point, but... uh, I had missed out on that opportunity. So uh, we'll, we'll get all caught up after the pandemic's over. But uh, in the meantime, things have been fun. Let's jump right in and talk about how your city is faring through the various crises we've had. And let's start with COVID and see how are things going? How are you managing the, you, the response and then the recovery dollars that are just coming down from the, from the federal government? How do you plan to use those to to help repair some of the damage that was done? Well, you know, a few different things, and it has just been an incredibly trying and challenging year, but uh, I'm proud of the fact that Kansas Cityans have really stepped up and been ready to handle um, all of those challenges. We've had our mask mandates, our other items to protect folks in place for some time now, and uh, we probably will continue, of course, to have those types of items in place to protect us. So that's something that I've been very heartened by and about. In terms of, you know, the federal government, it really has been exceptional to uh, have the cooperation of the current administration in terms of getting money to America's cities. We were in tough shape in Kansas City and a lot of places, and it was through no fault of the cities themselves. It was because we saw significant change. We saw folks that weren't going to conventions. We saw, you know, rental car taxes go down almost nothing and they support things. I mean, all of those steps that were just kind of expected for us and how we built out a city budget changed pretty precipitously. And so I am glad that uh, we do have stimulus funds coming to Kansas City, several hundred million dollars. It's going to be very important. It's going to be very well spent. 
Step one, we'll spend it responsibly to make sure that we're replenishing our reserves to make sure that we can keep our employees, not have to fire, lay off anyone. And so those are at least some of the steps. I think additional steps will relate to the fact that we're able to invest in things long term that we had wished to do, particularly as it relates to affordable housing. We have a homelessness crisis in Kansas City, like many other places. This is something that's going to be important for us and being able to uh, get to that next step of things and making sure that uh, we can take care of our whole community. And how do you balance some of the short term needs that people are feeling acutely as a result of this crisis? with making some long-term investments that maybe spur some longer-term and more sustainable economic growth? Well, you know, I think it is us not separating the two. I think it is us recognizing and saying that, uh, you know, we are at a position now where we want to invest in housing, for example, permanent housing solutions, so that people can actually ultimately build wealth. You know, it is looking at those who are experiencing homelessness now and saying, how can we get you into some level of transitional housing that then leads to a more permanent housing situation that then leads to a way for you to invest in us to get invested in you? Those are the multiple steps that I think are important for us as things go along. That would be my idea and view of how these things should work. And while you were on the city council, you you authored a strategy or a new policy around uh, affordability and housing. How do you sort of find that that point where you can create both housing for people who are experiencing homelessness, but also people who are just at risk in the housing market of falling into homelessness or or just using all their income to tr- try to stay in their home? You know, I think there are a few separate ways we do it. I mean, typically, govern, local governments look at shelters and rental assistance as two of our primary options. We have that in Kansas City, and those will continue to be important. However... Looking at a few other things, we've, we've created a housing trust fund in Kansas City. Now the challenge is how do we make sure we actually fund it? A lot of that effort will relate to how do you make sure that you have gap filling? One of the most important things in life, really, is, all right, somebody's working every day. Let's say they make minimum wage, which out here is still just $8.75 an hour. So they are not even able necessarily to pay a fair rent price. So can you find a way to allow them to have that bridge so that they can make rent each month, perhaps even have some money for savings so that they can build up those investments for their own future? I mean, those are the sorts of things that we want to be able to do. And I think that's what smart and prudent local governments will be doing uh, with this tranche of funds. And then you've also been a not only a local champion, but a national champion on creating free public transportation as a way to... Uh, increase economic opportunity and address inequity in our society. Can you talk about your efforts around that? And obviously public transportation has taken a significant hit during this crisis and and what you can do to to sort of rebuild that important piece of our infrastructure. Well, you know, a few different things that I think are so important for us. First of which is that uh, we are in a position that uh, we can afford zero fare transit, fare free transit in Kansas City. I think that has been incredibly important for us. And it is something that, you know, we have been able to expand to our entire system here for the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority. In each person's pockets, we're able to put back in about $1,500 a year if you're a regular bus rider. And that's a lot of folks that need that type of money, need that to support their families, need that to try to make sure that they're building long-term sustainable income streams, right, that aren't being diverted because you got to pay for your bus fare, you got to catch this, that, and the other. And so I think that that has been something that is, is essential for me. You also have to always think about how do we get to better bus routes? How do you make sure that the transit that we're building is actually for the people who are heavily riding the system today? You know, oftentimes in local government, we build kind of these aspirational routes because we want to attract new riders. That's cool. I get that. I like that. But I also want to make sure that the men and women, particularly so many in our most disadvantaged communities, have the chance to have consistent routes, more opportunities to get to work, to get to the doctor, to get to places they need to at a more efficient level. That makes that makes a lot of sense. And I think so many cities are watching your efforts in Kansas City and, and looking for a, a, a model forward that, that can be replicated because there's a lot of opportunity if you can get it right. Yeah, absolutely. 
I want to talk a little bit about criminal justice reform, the decriminalization of cannabis, and your efforts around that as a way to you know address many of the injustices around over-incarceration that we've seen in, in our history and your city's history? Well, you know, a few different things about that. I mean, it is, uh, uh, for me, it's always been foundational that criminal justice reform actually has to be a local conversation. It isn't just, you know, uh, a question of what happens in Washington. It is not just sentencing guidelines, although those are all important. It is instead the sort of thing where you say, how do we make your day-to-day interactions with people better? How do you make it so that the person who really has a financial issue from not paying their parking tickets or having a speeding ticket and getting a warrant from it isn't actually somebody who's getting you know, sent, to, sent to jail because they can't afford to take care of certain problems? I mean, those are the sorts of things that I believe will be important for us. And uh, that's what Kansas City has done. So it's been... Uh, something we've seen both in marijuana decriminalization. We've seen it in decriminalization of parking tickets, as I've called it. We'll continue to see how our, how can we find ways to have a less punitive approach to things that are really just poverty. And I absolutely think we need to decriminalize poverty. We need to make sure that we're creating opportunities for people to build themselves back up faster. And that's much of the work that I think is essential for us along the way. And how do you balance or how do you approach that when many of these laws are at the state level and obviously you have a different party in power at the state than you do locally in Kansas City? How do you see that dynamic playing itself out? You know, I'm not going to lie. It's not easy. I think there is a different viewpoint sometimes in our state capitals and at city halls. You know, and I say this in fairness to all states. I spent time in my life in Missouri and in the state of New York. A majority Democratic legislature, a majority Republican one, and both had some issues in how they interacted with America's cities and cities in their states. The way we try to do it is this. We try to make clear our perspective. We try to do what's right, but more than anything, we get ready. You know, you don't waste your time waiting on uh, our state capital to fulfill all your requests because it usually doesn't happen. Instead, what you do is you find ways to fix these issues on a local level. You try to generate funding from the local side. You work on lots of public-private partnerships. You do things that make a a big and significant difference for us along the way. That's the sort of thing that I think you try to get done, and that's what Kansas City will continue to do, despite whatever challenges we may face from our friends in the legislature. That's a that's a very patient but realistic uh, and realistic approach to what must be an enormously challenging way to govern because so many of the issues you want to work on you aren't in complete control of your of your own destiny. But I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, the idea of just being being ready and doing what you can within the area that, over, over which you have influence. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk about your journey into public service and also what what inspired you to run for city council that first time and then the second when you're running for mayor you didn't have the support of the establishment and and what made you ready and willing to take that take that leap. So you know a few different things. I mean my trajectory here was being a kid from the neighborhoods, right? And I always cared about creating more opportunities for somebody who was living in circumstances that I once knew experiencing homelessness, catching the bus, having a mother who worked hard every day, being watched by whoever would watch you and sometimes taking care of yourself. I mean, those are the sorts of things that I've known along the way. And uh, I've been proud to try to make sure that we could have an impact back. That said, I believe that we need to make sure more than anything that we as a community are listening to those voices. Too often, uh, particularly during the last decade, you know, there's this big conversation about public-private partnership, which usually was giving up city money <laughs> for for businesses instead of it going the other way around. And actually, let's think about how we can help the people. And so it was always a focus of mine that we got back to figuring out, hey, how can we look out for folks? How can we actually really be something about not what the establishment wants, but what regular folks want? And so I remember when I ran, yeah, I was out, I was out fundraised, out endorsed, everything else. But uh, you know, we ran one hell of a campaign because we reached people because we talked about issues they care about, affordable housing, potholes, all types of things that make a world of difference. And I was proud of the fact that we were able to do that, and I think that helped me get to this very position today. 
And as someone who grew up in Kansas City, I guess I'd be interested in sort of what do you see as has how the city has changed in your lifetime? And then what do you see for the next 10 or 15 years? What do you think Kansas City will be like? Well, you know, it has changed for the better. We've done a, a good job of getting more folks, you know, into new opportunities, but not good enough. Too many neighborhoods that I grew up in look the same that they did in the 1980s. Too many people uh, don't believe that they have uh, positive opportunities for their future. So I do think that there is much work that needs to be done in connection with where we can go and what we can do next. And, uh, you know, that, that's where you know, I am. I think that it's an exciting time for cities, but it's also a time where we need to step back and say, how can we make things better for people? How can we make sure that the work we're doing doesn't just have an impact in some neighborhoods, just a few, but all throughout our cities? And there's some now, I, I think, nervousness about what what happens to downtowns, what happens to cities uh, as work maybe becomes more flexible and re- and remote. How do you plan to address that in your city, and what do you see happening on the ground? Well, you know, I think, first of all, we're all going to see kind of uh, how it looks this year. Uh, we have a local income tax, so it'll be interesting to see where revenues exist. But, um, you know, I think that people will still congregate. The question just is, how do we make sure that when they're congregating, we are in a position to uh, to make sure that there is some level of creativity in what an office space looks like? You know, you're not going to have gigantic office spaces, perhaps, with the cubicles and all that sort of stuff anymore. But you will continue to have, I think, open workspaces. You will need meeting rooms. You will need creative spaces. And so I think it's a story of how does Kansas City make sure that it is in a position to kind of get back to being that sort of attractive place that it needs to be in terms of what the next phase of office looks like. It's not going to be the same as it was before, but I do think that there will be something that connects all of us. And I guess what role, I I think while people certainly may like the flexibility and freedom. They're also social animals, and cities play a major role in bringing people together. As you, as we started, first, you know, with sports teams being a, a primary example of that, how do you see the role of the city in creating public spaces for everyone, for, for people to connect and share ideas and share experiences and be part of a, be part of a larger whole? Well, you know, uh, it is uh, it is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, you have seen even during the pandemic how people still find ways to congregate even distanced. You know, there's a giant union station in Kansas City and there's a, this big hill and that last summer became almost beach-like, but everybody was spaced, but everybody still wanted to be in this communal environment. And I think whether it be engagement with the arts outdoors and music whether it be engagement with how we all move around on a public transportation model, it is ensuring that we have the focus and the energy to make sure that we are building public spaces in a public realm that advantages the American city. And that's, I think, some of the work that I will continue to do. And, uh, you know, I think we it's something of which we can be quite proud in Kansas City. And every great city is spending a lot of time thinking about at this very point. That makes sense. Something else that you all can be proud of is, you know, in the wake of national racial unrest, uh, you proposed a really innovative anti-violence program, Becoming a Man and Working on Womanhood. And they provide counseling and mental health services, trauma support, mentorship. Can you talk a little bit about the launch of that program, how it's going, and and where you think there's opportunities to, to increase the scale uh, of programs like this? You know, I think uh, our connection with those types of programs is something that uh, is is really looking at getting outside of the politics. How do you manage to really build up our young people? That's what BAM's about. That's what WOW is about. And I think that the work that Kansas City has done is said, how can we remove some of the politics out of our discussions on safety and really focus on that which is most important for us, which is reaching our young people, reaching our young people really early. 
and giving them hope in the opportunities that they're looking for. That's the the biggest deal for us. And so that's why so much of what our discussion has been about isn't necessarily even on funding questions. It is on what works, what's important, and where do we need to do better? And I think, you know, as a guy who's never met his father, I am someone who has said, how do I build mentors for people? How do we build more opportunities for people? And that's the sort of step that I think is um, so essential. And are you seeing some of the benefits? I mean, I, it's, a, it's a relatively new program, but at least anecdotally, what are, what are you seeing as, as the effects of these programs on, on the ground? Uh, you know, the first thing I've seen is that, particularly in a year like this, when it has been very hard for people to even get together, kids are excited that somebody's reaching out to them. Folks are, are pumped about the opportunity to really try to work together and get engaged in a way that we don't usually do. So I, I have been heartened by, I think, some of the steps that we've been able to take at this time. And uh, I look forward to us being even more active and aggressive in connection with you know what's coming ahead for our work on what it is that we're doing to fight violent crime at its root, not just working on you know the steps that we we need to take to, you know, have police detectives or have all of these kind of end of the line stuff. Instead, we're actually taking the real steps up front to try to, I think, make the change that's necessary. I appreciate it. I think we're all watching and, and hoping to learn from what, what's happening in Kansas City and seeing what can be applied across the rest of the country. Absolutely. I want to wrap up with a question for you about our overall state of our democracy. We're watching attacks on voting rights happen across the country, including in your state. And what's the role of city and city leaders in trying to ensure that our democracy continues to function and be accessible to people in this day and age? You know, I think particularly over this last year, as we saw tension emanating often even within the federal government, but between the federal and state governments. A lot of people said, you know, what's the city doing? A lot of mayors had to step up. I was one of them. And I think there are a lot of folks that are saying, all right, how can we do, how can we do better? How can we improve things? How can we listen to our public? How can we, in a season of protests or a season of COVID-19, a season of orders, make sure that people still know that they are listened to? There is no greater political unit than the American city and being able to do that sort of thing and giving people that sense of pride, but more than anything, and letting people know that uh, somebody's looking out for them, removed from the big politics, removed from all this other challenge and mess, just saying that we care. And I've been proud to be a part of that. And I think we're going to continue to make key differences on that for a while ahead. First of all, let me just thank you for your service and thank you for you know, being a champion, not just for your city, but for other cities on issues like addressing violence on public transportation and affordable housing. It's a great benefit to all of us out here, the work that you're doing in Kansas City, and, and we're grateful. Well, thank you. Thank you for all that you do and sharing these important messages with so many. And uh, I look forward to talking to even more folks along the way, but we appreciate you and all that you do. Thank you, Mayor Lucas, and, and have a good day and good luck to the Royals this season. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty. And because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast.